Hi there everyone, I'm making this video to talk about the current progress of my journey into astronomy. For those not in the know, three years ago I quit my job and up and left my country to do my master's in science by research in New Zealand. I've since completed said course and here is my certificate. Ah, master's of science! <laughs> ah, master's of science by research. So I recently got my result, which was great, and I'm now back in my hometown of Bandar Baru Bangi, Malaysia, um, waiting out the floods and the plagues while I figure out what to do next. So I want to make this video as a sort of retrospect to think about what I've done, how it has affected me, and what it means for the future. Now the reason why this video is titled Two Years in Astronomy is because I'm not counting 2019, even though I had officially started my master's at that time. Um, I spent most of the 2019 first year of master's uh, doing computer science courses, which I thought was pretty awesome, enlightening, and mind-opening. Uh, I spent some time learning about artificial intelligence, nature-inspired computing, and statistics. Just because you like hiking doesn't mean you like nature-inspired computing. <laughs> Just because you like nature doesn't mean you might like nature-inspired computing. But it was awesome, though. I, I really enjoyed that paper. Um, the bulk of the learning in 2019 came from a variety of different disciplines, which was useful. And that year really made me think about my prior choice of doing engineering for four years at MMU Cyberjaya for my undergrad. And then there was this bias that the engineering students were a league above the computer science and IT kids. And after 2019, I definitely feel like that's not the case anymore. And education in software has a power of its own and is definitely a valuable skill to have and apply. But yeah, anyway, astronomy! <laughs> Isn't that a Metallica song? And not to be mistaken with astrology, which is complete BS, and not to be mistaken with aerospace engineering, which teaches us how to build rockets and put satellites into orbit and how to get from point A to point B in the universe without exploding into a billion tiny little pieces. Uh, astronomy is the field of study of objects in outer space that are usually very far away from us. Uh, the area of astronomy that I chose to dive into was radio astronomy. And that is astronomy done in the low frequency, long wavelength portion of the light spectrum, where the atmosphere is transparent at a certain window. The, the, the atmosphere of our planet is, there's a window that allows these radio waves to come through. And this allows us to build massive arrays of parabolic dishes and occasionally a gigantic single dish in order to collect the photons traveling from space at these radio frequencies in order to find out what had sent them on their way? And the answer to that is some pretty amazing stuff, actually. We can map out the hydrogen content of the universe using radio astronomy, and hydrogen, after billions of years of cosmic evolution, eventually becomes people. And people, who are all of us interested in our origins and where we came from, are, we're able to look back into the past to observe one of the earliest epochs of the universe uh, the, called the Age of Reionization, when the first massive stars, more than 30 times the mass of the sun, first formed. Um, we can do that using radio astronomy. But where I come into the picture, ladies and gentlemen, is in the study of stellar zombies, uh, the, the things you get when stars end their lives. So they rise again as these stellar zombies called pulsars that are left behind in the wake of supernova. And I spent most of 2020 and a fair bit of 2021 earlier this year carrying out the research and writing my thesis entitled A Study of Birefringent Scintillation Towards the Millisecond Pulsar J0437-4715. And there's a video on my channel that summarizes the outcome of this project if you are interested. So I won't go uh, into the details of that here, but I want what I want to talk about is actually the value of the education that I received and the experience that I had. Now, mind you, before this master's, I had no formal education in astronomy or physics for that matter. 
Uh, we really only get the basics of physics in our first year of engineering. I was motivated to pursue a master's in astronomy because I thought that at the time, the coolest job in the universe would be that of an astronomer. My dream job, I think, is a part-time astronomer researcher and a part-time science communicator at your local planetarium or observatory that's open to the public to get paid for that would be just ace. <laughs> so really starting out with my master's, I just dived right into it, harder than 10,000 rocks on the lake, to quote a certain underrated Ed Sheeran song. <laughs> that should have been a single, like a, a rate that received major radio time, but I digress. Now, this headstrong mindset of diving into the experience, I think really uh, empowered me in a good way throughout. Um, my message, especially to young people out there who may be keen on attempting something similar, uh, is that nothing bad can ever come out of pursuing this type of endeavor. And, you know, when times got tough, I kind of repeated this to myself as a sort of mantra that no matter what happens, nothing bad can ever come out of applying yourself to this discipline and, you know, applying yourself to an education. And to think back on it, I was definitely over my head and out of my league. But if you allow yourself to just jump in and give it what you can and give it all you have, whatever you become at the end of it, uh, whatever you come out as afterwards will no doubt have a net positive uh, impact on you as an individual. And through my master's, I was able to find that out firsthand. I think to Jordan Peterson's Rule 7 in 12 Rules for Life, that is, to pursue what is meaningful, not what is expedient. And meaningful things aren't always easy. And astrophysics is no joke, my friends. It required me to sit down and sacrifice, but still pushing ahead, this meaningful pursuit opened for me life paths that I never knew I could lead. Before my master's, I was working for Telecom Malaysia as a network and web security engineer and doing some coding here and there. And, and that was one life that I could have had for 10 years down the road. But this master's showed me that I'm also worth my salt in a data science and analytics career, should the research life not pan out the way I thought it would. Of course, there are plenty of other ways in which the pursuit of astronomy is, uh, can be enriching and empowering. Uh, astronomy is said to be a very humbling and character-building experience. Notice the way I said humbling <laughs> in, in, uh, in an imitation of one of the goats, Carl Sagan, yeah, who, who was one of the big reasons that I got into astronomy. Uh, and what is remarkable about astronomy is that uh, the data that we usually handle have traveled many light years to reach us, and astronomers often observe things that most of the population of planet Earth have never seen before. And there be unknown knowledge of the universe and wisdom of the universe in that data, my friend. There are amazing things to discover in the data. It makes me think of the tears in the rain speech from Blade Runner, which goes, I've seen things you people won't believe. Attack ships on fire off the shoulder of Orion. Sea beams glitter in the dark near Tannhauser Gate. Yeah, after it all, after all of it, everything we see is de decomposable at the table of numbers, which is where the true beauty lies. Now that last part, I kind of fudged onto it. That was on me. Which brings me to another impact of my master's experience. It has given me a greater appreciation of mathematics. It has shown me the beauty of mathematics. Now, I'm not the best mathematician around. Uh, my, knowledge, my knowledge nowhere nears parallel a lot of the astronomers out there. And, but through undertaking astronomy, I have taken the first tentative steps towards developing this unique way of interpreting the universe in a mathematical sense, from the data and the distributions that nature presents to us. And to be frank with you, it's a damn good sight to have. You find yourself better able to deal with the uncertainties in life, I guess, and in the data once you've been able to quantify it. Uh, how to By drawing upper limits and drawing error bars, that's been very rewarding for me yeah 
Now, I got into astronomy inspired by the pretty pictures, thinking that I would get a chance to see more, and certainly I have. <laughs> but I've gotten out of it an appreciation for rigorous numerical analysis. And to me, that's a part of the character building journey. Now, following my master's, I'm currently collaborating with Nicholas Copernicus Institute in Poland as, uh, for an internship to do some uh, polarimetry of an eclipsing debris disk of the variable star EE Cephe, or Cephei, if you're American. <laughs> and the data coming off that telescope uh, is every bit as beautiful as you can imagine, coming off a 60 centimeter optical rig on Mount Suhora in Poland. It, it's a, it looks like a 2D plane with a smattering of several points of light that make up the stars, and your target is somewhere in the center. But once the photometry is done and we've gotten the flux counts from the image, everything just becomes a table full of numbers in Excel format, which we can extract knowledge and science from. And I find as much, if not more, excitement looking at the Excel tables as I do observing the bright dots generated by the telescope CCD. And that's the type of paradigm shift that a good education can give you. That's the type of shift in perspective that a worthwhile education can give you. It doesn't have to be astronomy. It can be uh, biology or chemistry. Like, you know, when you've gone through this experience, it changes the way you look at and appreciate certain things in ways that you would have never expected. And by the way, astronomers nowadays are pretty much observing on their laptops. It's no longer the iconic picture of Edwin Hubble peering through the giant glass of the telescope on Mount Wilson as we've seen in, in the photographs. Uh, the most advanced telescopes of today, uh, such as the James Webb, uh, the Square Kilometer Array, and uh, what's that? Um, the big optical rigs, Mauna Kea in Hawaii, yeah, they're, they're pretty much robots. And uh, the lives of astronomies are, astronomers are not too different from software developers. Astronomers are really just a weird class of um, enthusiastic people willing to carry out series of complex linear algebraic operations on obscure data sets. That's how I would summarize what these people are like. Astronomers are just a class of people willing to carry out a series of complex linear algebra on obscure data sets. <laughs> yeah, that's as simple as it gets, whatever. Uh, now speaking of astronomers, they are amazing people. During the last uh, two years, three years, I've had the privilege of uh, meeting a few from Chile, from the Netherlands, Poland, and New Zealand. And I am most struck by their ability to interpret data as if they had a hidden third eye, Sharingan, and they see the stars as if it was all made of chakra. <laughs> that was a Naruto reference by the way. Now, some of them may have been born smart. They, they, they may have been just the type of people that just gravitated to this field as if the universe called out to them. I think the universe calls out to us all. But of course, now that's also backed up by their experience. Now, this natural talent is also backed up by the their experience of many years in the field. And for me, as for me, I, I've definitely had to work harder for it. And I wouldn't say I'm natural, but I think some of the building blocks are there. You just have to develop on top of it. Uh, and I think it is possible for normal, ordinary people like you and I to develop a similar sharingan of their own, given enough time and effort, especially if you think the juice is worth the squeeze. First class, baby. Uh, yeah. Now, if you're out there and you're listening to this uh, and you are keen on starting some sort of postgraduate education in STEM, even if it's some far off obscure topic like quantum biology or recombinant memetics or computational social science, blah, blah, <laughs> you, you can go the distance, my friend. So as long as you just, you can go the distance, uh, just take the shot. And the most important thing is to ask the right questions. Have a bit of discipline and nose to the grindstone. So what's next for me? Well, I'm currently in the midst of writing a conference paper on radio frequency interference mitigation 
on Pulsar data that's supposed to be a part of the RFI 2022 conference in Reading in the United Kingdom. I've never been to the UK, would love to go. It's the heartland, the homeland of Warhammer. Hey, um, unfortunately, COVID killed the live event, so it went full virtual. And uh, I will be here doing research in, in my house, uh, in my hometown, um, until that paper is done. I'm currently implementing a deep learning framework for the identification of man-made signals that corrupt radio astronomical data, which is fun. You can imagine all of the old and seasoned radio astronomers at this conference would be like, you crazy kids, turn off your damn cell phones. We're trying to do some science here. What's cool is that this project lives at the intersection of engineering and astronomy. And once that's done, I may consider a PhD or I may work in industry to pay off my undergraduate student debt. I'm not sure yet. We'll have to wait till March of next year which is in a few days. Mar next year is in a few days as of recording this um, uh, in order to find out what will happen. So that's all from me. Thank you so much for listening to my ramblings. I hope you have a nice day. Cheerio and bye-bye.